Hey guys, welcome to my first attempt at a supplemental lecture. This is going to fall um, before the lecture that I'm giving on Tuesday, so please watch this video before you come into class. Um, we're talking about 15th century Europe, in specifically Northern Europe today, and you'll notice um, on the handout that I've included with this email that everything stylistically it's going to be the regional um, thing for slide ID is Northern Europe. So let's take a look. The chapter starts with Jan van Eyck, the double portrait of Gian Giovanni Arnolfini and his wife. This is a very famous image that we're going to get into in greater detail, probably in class actually on Tuesday. But we just want to talk a little bit about um, Northern Europe and the fact that in the 15th century, especially Northern Europe, saw an emergence of wealthy merchants. This rise to power was fueled by individual accomplishment and it was not hereditary succession within noble families a lot of the time that led to wealth. This is pretty distinct difference from the way that wealth was essentially inherited in the past. So we're going to see a lot in Northern Europe that the wealth is accumulated through um, individual accomplishment, which is pretty important. We're going to see a bit of a shift in terms of some of the um, types of art and the things that are the art is focusing on. It's not always going to be religious and it's not always going to be this, the typical stuff that we've seen in the past in terms of kings and queens and very, very rich patrons. Um, so here, Giovanni Arnolfini the book says he earned rather than inherited his right to be recorded by Jan van Eyck, uh, meaning that instead of just being born into a wealthy family, which he normally, like you get, if you're a prince, you get a portrait done of yourself. But in this case, um, through trade and being um, a savvy businessman, he accumulated wealth and then hired someone to do his portrait. Um, and it should be noted that though this painting takes place in a secular setting, the picture resonates with sacred meaning. We will, when we look at this in more detail, we'll notice there are crystal prayer beads hanging next to the convex mirror in the back. So prayer beads back there. Um, we know that the couple is pious, so that's an important part of these works. Even though a lot will be more secular than in the past, they still have religious connotations because Northern Europe they definitely still had, um, they were very, very religious people. Okay. So oh, there we go. Emergence of wealthy merchants, individual accomplishment, not hereditary succession. And if you ever need to pause this video to take notes, of course, you should definitely do that. Okay, so the Northern Renaissance. We are going to be talking about the Renaissance that probably everybody knows about um, in Italy. That's coming after this next exam. So we talk about the Northern Renaissance and people aren't as familiar with it. So we need to talk about what to expect. Um, so the Renaissance, which just literally means um, rebirth in French. So Renaissance, French for rebirth. It's one of your vocab words. Um, it essentially revitalized civic life and economic growth in the late 14th century. It gives rise to a prosperous middle class, which supports scholarship, literature, and the arts. So that's important, um, which then leads to this explosion of learning and creativity, and we refer to this as the Northern Renaissance, or just Renaissance in general. Um, the new power of cities like Flanders and the Greater Netherlands provided a necessary balance with the traditional powers of royalty and the church. So, let's see. So what should we expect to see in Northern Renaissance painting? We will start to see an interest in the natural world. So artists are observing plants, birds, and animals closely and depicting their appearance with breathtaking accuracy. We'll look at this painting more closely a little later. Actually, this is a tapestry. We will see the same scrutiny applied to people and objects. So there will be an accurate modeling of forms using light and shadow. Remember that term chiaroscuro, 
that we talked about in last class, um, that's going to give them the semblance of three-dimensionality. And then there's this use of what we call intuitive perspective, where a subjects diminish in scale as they recede into the distance. It's not correct one-point perspective yet. We haven't seen that, um, or we won't see that for a little while yet, but we do see this interesting sense of intuitive perspective, and we'll look at that um, a little bit later. Okay, and then in the portrayal of landscapes, artists use atmospheric perspective, where distant elements appear increasingly indistinct and less colorful as they approach the background. So you can see in the background here um, that there is a use of atmospheric perspective. Let's see if I can, since I don't have my laser pointer, we can just sort of show you this way. That's fun. Okay. So let's look at this map again. So we know that um, the Dukes of Burgundy, it's a really important group, are the most powerful rulers in Northern Europe. Um, their major seaport was Bruges, right here. And the Dukes of Burgundy and Berry, also, central France, were the real arbiters of taste. So um, where once it might have been the King of France, now it's actually the Dukes that are in charge of what is uh, popular in art. So um, the French king held court in Paris, but the dukes held more splendid courts in their own cities. And um, like I said, that major seaport, Bruges, was the commercial center of northern Europe, and it rivaled the Italian city-states of Florence, Milan, and Venice as an economic hub. So they're getting really wealthy, and we'll see them get even more wealthy um, into the Baroque era. They have a lot of money because of all the trade that is going on. Okay, let's start with, uh, I guess this is the second slide in your slide packet. Um, the Annunciation, Visitation, and Presentation in the Temple, as well as the Flight into Egypt. This is from the exterior wings of the altarpiece of the Chartreuse de Champmol. Um, and let's just talk about what we're looking at. You'll see up in the top left corner here, we have what's called the international style, um, which, interna sorry, international Gothic style. And that's something that you need to be able to recognize. Um, it's a new composite style, which emerges in the late 14th century. It's characterized by slender, gracefully posed figures, delicate features, and complex headdresses. Not so many complex headdresses here, but we'll see some more of that. Um, there are richly embroidered fabrics and elaborate jewelry. We can notice that spatially the recession is represented by rising tile floors and rooms which look like stage sets almost. And you can tell that the buildings here, they're not big enough. They're not realistic in a way that you might expect. At, well, it doesn't look like a real house. Instead, it, it looks more like what you might put on a stage in a theater to represent a house. And again, there's that perspective that's not correct. It's an intuitive perspective, like we talked about a couple slides ago. Okay, so we're also noticing that details of nature, though miniaturized, are rendered in breathtaking detail. So um, though this <laughs> landscape back here is small, it doesn't totally make sense, um, it is very detailed and really quite lovely to look at. Um, also, we'll notice in general that they use a brilliant use of color and gilding to create this international Gothic style. Um, and like I said, this is done for the Cartesian Monastery Chartreuse, which also means it's just Charter House, at Champmol outside of Dijon. Um, it is an altarpiece which depicts scenes of the crucifixion, flanked by the adoration of the Magi and the entombment. It is the exterior protective shutters that we see here, but they're not done by carvings, but by paintings, showing scenes from the life of the Virgin and the infancy of Christ. Um, on the left-hand side here, um, Gabrielle, uh, sorry, Gabriel meets Mary while she is at prayer, um, and she sits in this Gothic room with the back door leading into a dark interior. Um, there's a Romanesque rotunda in the background, which indicates the Temple of Jerusalem. There's a tiny enclosed garden to the left with lilies, which are a symbol of Mary's virginity. 
Um, and then the floors are tilted up to give us a better view of the action. On the right, Mary and Joseph have brought newborn Jesus to the temple of his redemption and for Mary's purification. And at the far right, they flee to Egypt. Um, my favorite part is this like little pagan statue up on the right-hand side, which has fallen over and broken. It's tumbling from its pedestal as the Christ child approaches. Kind of an interesting little addition. Oh, there's Shantmol. And then if you were curious as to what these altar pieces kind of looked like, um, if, uh, again, as usual, I will always put vocab that you need to know on your vocab handout, but just know how a, an altar piece might appear with these movable wings on the outside that open and close. Um, the antipendium, it's an important thing to know. Uh, it's the altar front. We'll see a lot of artwork that comes from that. And the predella. So um, like I said, it'll be on your vocab list if you need to know those for the next exam. Okay, now as soon as we started the international gothic style, we've moved away from it as usual. Uh, <laughs> quick in and out. So this is the uh, Monumental Well of Moses. This is not done in the International Gothic style, but we will notice other indications of the International Gothic style later. I don't know why the book moves so quickly in between these things, but it's all right. Um, this is for Chartreuse's main cloister. It was begun in 1395 and unfinished. So it was left unfinished at Sluter's death. Um, and this is one of the things that I want you to watch the Khan Academy video for. So I've included a, a link in your email. Please watch that video. So pause this, watch that video, and then come back and uh, come back and continue watching this lecture. Okay. Okay, you're back. Hope you enjoyed that video. Um, now let's, uh, let's see. Sorry, I can't edit this. So if I go back and forth, I apologize. Um, I just, I think I wanted to just mention that, that, like I said, the International Gothic is abandoned here. There are highly individualized figures. It's not ideal, like the faces are not idealized. They're not elongated. Um, the drapery seems fairly realistic. There's a lot of the, a lot of naturalism, but there would have been rich colors. So, um, that was still an International Gothic thing, right, to have all these rich, bright colors, which were preferred by patrons. Okay. So let's talk about the Limburg brothers. Um, this is another video that um, I'd like you to just watch so you can take a look at these very, very detailed manuscript illuminations. Um, the particular video that I've linked is not for the um, très rich heure, which means basically the uh, very fine book of hours is kind of what it's referring to. It's actually, um, you'll see the Belle Heure, which is just the, um, it's a manuscript that they illuminated also for the Duke of Berry, but did that one first. So this is considered to be one of their finest. Um, okay, so I'll show that video and you can look at it. Pardon my French pronunciation. Um, <laughs> so we know that there are secular texts as well as religious ones. Just in general, for the illumi illuminated manuscripts, um, we see herbal encyclopedias, so books of plants. We see history books. We see books of just literature, which is great. Um, and these tip the typical text would maybe have a small inset pic picture, but only those really the most lavish books for the most wealthy patrons would have full page miniatures, um, as we'll look at here. Those miniatures will kind of appear as windows looking into rooms and onto landscapes. Um, and those landscapes will off often have a distant horizon. The three brothers, Paul, um, Herman, and Jean, they have the last name Limburg. That's only because, as we've talked about before, it's their their region, their home region, so of Limburg, and um, they created this very sumptuous book of hours. That's essentially how it translates. I'm not gonna do the French again. Um, they did this between 1411 and 1416 for the Duke of Berry. This is the second 
work that they produced for him, a book of hours that they produced for him. So as we know, we talked about last class that uh, these books of hours, they're daily devotional. They had daily devotional prayers in them. They had a calendar of, uh, so along with those prayers, they also had a calendar of holy days. And the Lindbergh brothers created these full page illustrations for each one of the calendar months. And a lot of them had sort of, well, we'll see a couple of different examples, but this is from February. And in this case, we're, we see more of the peasantry. So we don't see the Duke of Berry here, um, but this is kind of an, we see peasant laborers. Also, there's some, we'll, we'll see aristocratic pleasures as well on different pages, but what oftentimes they would show, um, not just the Lindbergh brothers, but a lot of people would show the peasants are doing either toiling away, that was popular, uh, toiling away for the aristocracy, not particularly looking unhappy about it, right? Just happily working away for the aristocracy, or um, they would show them doing <laughs> uh, like uncouth sort of pastime things that the aristocracy could laugh at their lifestyle. Um, it would be amusing for the aristocracy to see what the poor people did in their off time. So um, that's not so true of the très rich heure, très rich heure. Um, and so we'll see here, there's a little bit more, I mean, no one's doing anything silly or embarrassing here, but there's an interesting um, kind of hierarchy of scale, which is done realistically as opposed to the way that you might expect a hierarchy of scale to work um, in uh, different, like older pieces of artwork. For instance, the woman in the front here in the foreground, she is a little bit more important. She's a little bit uh, more finely dressed. She's a higher up on the like the hierarchy of um, just importance in terms of wealth, but. She's bigger, not just because she's more important, but because it makes sense. The people that are less important are farther away. And so there is this sense that um, they do understand perspective a little. It's a, it's a again, that intuitive perspective. Um, and then you have the little church in the background. It doesn't quite make sense how everything goes into the background, but it's still this sense that if it's farther away, it's smaller, which is nice. Um, and then the other uh, example of this, this is actually, so this is January, this is the Duke of Berry at the table, so we're actually seeing um, more of the arist aristocracy and ha them having a nice time. Look at the really wonderful colors here. Let's see if there's anything else I want to say about it. Um, really, really amazing use of detail. So this is something that we're going to see just characterizing the um, the Northern Renaissance, the Northern art from this time period is so very, very detailed. Um, oh, I also wanted to talk about, just for a second, sorry, the horizon line, actually it's true of both of these pictures. The horizon line is very high um, within the composition and this was really characteristic of the international Gothic style. So, um, because of the horizon line being so high, that kind of leads to this um, effect. So here's the horizon line back here, right, where everything, like our our view recedes back to that horizon line. It's very high up in the picture plane. And the effect is that the floor is kind of tilt up in that way that's so characteristic of the international Gothic style. Um, same here, we see a real... Oh, that's so irritating. Um, we see a real sense of a high, like there's the horizon line in the back again, very, very high. So the idea that everything is tilting up into our spatial, like into what we see here, um, how, how the floor really tilts up towards us is kind of supposed to make more sense because of that high horizon line. Also, that cutaway view of the house shows both ex interior and exterior space here, right? It's kind of a confusing, um, it's, it's confusing spatially. They're trying to show as much information as possible, and this kind of, it still feels like you're looking at the stage of a play. 
Okay, and then one of the finest painters of the Books of Hours, along with the Lindbergh brothers, was Mary of Burgundy Painter. It's sort of an annoying name because uh, the only reason that that's the name is because he painted Mary at her devotions for the Hours of Mary of Burgundy. So we don't know the actual name, we just know what he created. I'm assuming it's a he. Um, could have been a she, I suppose. So Mary of Burgundy was the only child of Charles the Bold, not Charles the Bald, um, Charles the Bold, who was a Duke of Burgundy, and he was the one who commissioned the Well of Moses for the Chartreuse altarpiece. Um, the painter here conjures up a complex pictorial space. So we look into this, but like remember, there, the illustrations in these manuscripts often feel like we're looking into a window. And here we're not just looking into a window, we're looking into two windows, right? So here's the first window, and then the second window um, is shit, obviously back here. And these two windows give us, a sen uh, give us two different periods of narrative time. Um, or rather, in this case, it's what she's imagining. We see um, Mary twice in this image. We see her here and we see her here. Okay, let's get rid of those funny lines that I just drew. <laughs> um, okay, so we're looking through the window, this, the, the frame that they've created. Um, we have a foreshortened opened window. Foreshortened, again, we've talked about this, means um, that it's not as, you know, that it's shortened correctly as it comes towards the viewer here. Just like legs can be foreshortened, this open window is also foreshortened. And the way that this blown glass, these circles here, they clearly the artist was looking at a uh, real source, like um, working from life. So Mary's depicted twice, as I said, in the foreground reading. She's contemplating the Book of Hours, which we are looking at, right? This is an illustration within the Book of Hours. And she's reading the Book of Hours. So there's a lot of like, I don't know, if anyone's seen that movie Inception, that's what this painting is like. Um, and in the background, she's imagining herself in the vision with Mary and the Christ child. So um, Mary's in the background here with the baby. And then, as we said, um, Mary of Burgundy uh, is right here again. So she's imagining herself at this really important place um, in time in the Bible. And this was really encouraged, uh, Christians were encouraged during this period to imagine themselves participating in biblical stories and sacred events so they could personally feel the experiences of the, procrast of the protagonists. Okay, let's look at this um, tapestry. This is one of four that survive. Um, in the 15th and 16th centuries, the best European tapestries came from Flanders. So that's Northern Europe. Um, among the most common subjects were foliage, flower patterns, and scenes from the lives of the saints. Also, we see classical mythology and history. Tapestries were great because they provided warmth and insulation on top of being decorative. So that's awesome. Um, and they could also, they, they showed off the owner's wealth. Um, on top of that, they were portable, and these courts would move from residence to residence, perhaps with uh, the seasons. So they would take these tapestries along with them. Unfortunately, because some tapestries were made with silver and gold threads, people later burned them to retrieve the precious materials, and we don't have a lot of these left. Um, there are a few royal tapestries that survive. The unicorn tapestry is part of a hunt for the unicorn series. There's seven, um, there were seven hangings, but only four of them survive, um, which, I'm sorry, I think actually seven of them survive, but four of them present people and animals set against a dense field of trees and flowers with a distant view of the castle um, with the unicorns. Uh, the tapestries are in unusually fine condition, so we may appreciate the rich colors and subtlety of the modeling of the faces, tonal variations of the fur, and even reflections in the water. These would have been woven on huge horizontal looms where weavers would use fine wool and colored silk into a coarser wool warp. Um, they worked from behind and checked their work with mirrors. It was a collaborative effort. Five or six weavers would work side by side. Let's look at a couple other ones. There's 
I'll show you the four um, that I was talking about. Let's see. It's pretty famous. Here's a, a close up. You can really see how detailed these are. Pretty amazing. Imagine someone looking into a mirror to make sure that their progress is, is um, going well. Okay, here's some more textiles to look at. This is the cope of the Order of the Golden Fleece. It's not a typo. Um, was it, uh, the Order of the Golden Fleece was an honorary fraternity founded by Duke Philip the Good of Burgundy. And um, in which for this, um, for this fraternity, 23 knights were chosen for their moral character and bravery. Um, religious services were an integral part of the order's meetings and opulent liturgical and clerical objects were created for the purpose. This is a cope, which is also just, it's basically a cloak, and it's divided into compartments and filled with standing figures of saints. The top, um, this part, which is the neck, basically is a figure of Christ. And let's see, zoom in for a second. You can see that the illusionistic effects of, of the Flemish painting, which was contemporary, contemporaneous to this, um, it's achieved with gold threads sewn into the surface using unevenly spaced colored silk threads. So that's pretty, pretty amazing. Okay. Let's talk about painting. This is the contemporary painting. We just saw this a minute ago, but um, this is very famous. The Merod altarpiece, we see some really distinct qualities to this work. So we know that there's a strong textile industry in the Northern Europe, in Flanders especially, um, and that economy created by the textile industry and international trade provides a stability and money for rapidly, um, yeah, this, so this growing economy, and we have these these artists that are now getting, it's basically a rapid flowering of the arts, sorry. Um, so civic groups, town councils, wealthy merchants, they're all important patrons in the Netherlands. Cities were self-governing and largely independent of, of nobility and the guilds would oversee almost every aspect of their members' lives. Um, High-ranking guild members sat on town councils and helped run city governments. And the Maraud altarpiece, we see a triptych. Remember, diptych, triptych, polyptych. Triptych has three parts to it. So that would be um, one, two, and three. This takes place in a living room, which is contemporary. For, it's, it should be, it looks as if it takes place in the 1500s. So we see it in a modern context. However, it is not meant to be um, a secular, secularized scene. Like it's meant to be a religious scene. Um, and we get the sense, right, that we're looking in the middle there. Uh, that's the Annunciation, okay? So it's a biblical scene, but it takes place in the 1500s in a Flemish home. So that's pretty interesting. Um, on the left-hand side, we see the donors. They are set in a closed garden. Remember, we talked about um, the garden being about virginity, probably. Um, the donors who essentially paid for this to be created. Once he got married, she was, that's his wife, she was uh, added later, okay? So once he got married, she was also added to the triptych. We notice, what do we notice? We notice that the Northern artist pays attention to everything. This is a cluttered painting. Uh, it doesn't have a serene sense of organization. It's like every single little detail is thrown in there. It's kind of a messy household that we're looking at. Um, there's a real interest in the direction of light. There's an interest in the folds of fabric. Um, there does not seem to be an emphasis placed on any particular item or person in the composition. That's very um, disconcerting for us, I think. As viewers, we're used to seeing a, a focal point that is easily identifiable. Here, everything is given the same weight. It's given the same importance. And so it becomes very cluttered feeling and almost overwhelming. And this is very, um, this, this is very typical of the Flemish and just in general Northern European painters of this time. 
the cloth, look at the cloth fa falling off of Gabriel and Mary. It's really hyper-realistic almost. Um, the way that those folds fall does not seem to be quite right. And yet, yeah, I, I don't know if hyper-realism is exactly the right term, but it's like they're made of crunchy paper or something. They're really, really paying attention to light and shadow, but it's um, almost surreal the way that that falls off of the knees. There is so much stuff. So we want to know, can we identify the meaning or the importance of objects within these compositions? Um, up here, up top, I don't think, do I have a, oh, there's one zoom in, but I don't think I've, so here's the Holy Spirit flying in. It's kind of hard to see. Um, little figure with a, holding a cross. Um, so you can see that going on up here. There's the Holy Spirit flying in through the circular window. Um, we will notice, I'm, I'll zoom in over here for a second, or in just a second, but the there's, a, there's woodworking going on, okay? Um, Christ being identified as a carpenter is important here. So we know that there are religious nods to parts of the Bible. Um, and I believe Joseph was a woodworker as well. So there's, there's importance here uh, for all of these objects have a little bit of a spiritual meaning as well as being just everyday objects that you would see in a normal Flemish household. Um, references to the cross, so the wood that he's working on, that might be a reference to the cross. The mouse traps are also a reference, and this is where we'll zoom into this area right here. Pretty amazing detail. There's a mouse trap, and this is uh, a reference to Christ, Christ's death. Um, as a trap for Satan. So that's pretty interesting. Mouse traps were like a big deal in um, this kind of this kind of artwork where they would represent some other religious thing. Um, that view through the window is amazing. Such extreme attention to detail and a real sense of an attempt at least at perspective. Um, if we come back here, you can see how, again, that international style, that the way that the floors just come up at us, they don't quite feel real. The spaces don't totally make sense. Okay, so let's look at Jan van Eyck. Um, he, we think on this, and unfortunately I just realized we don't have the frame in this image, which is a total bummer because the gold frame is actually important to this image. I don't know the book gives it to us or not, but um, if you want to go look it up online, so I don't have to, um, <laughs> so I don't have to stop recording here and start this all over. Yeah, in the book, if you look in the book on page 587, you'll notice that the frame is included, and um, that's pretty important to this because there are inscriptions that he put himself there. So um, you just kind of have to trust me on this unless you're looking at the image in the book. Um, he, we think that this is a self-portrait, first off, man in a red turban. Um, the inscription on the bottom of the frame says, as I can, which was a typical thing that scribes would put at the end of the man, of a manuscript as they finished it, which would say, as I can, not as I would, um, which as I can, not as I would is kind of, um, it's a humble thing to say. Uh, you gotta, I guess, <laughs> kind of trust me on that or trust the book because um, it's, but it's a little weird to say just as I can. There's nothing really humble about saying, look what I can do, which is essentially what he's saying. Um, he's definitely showing off here. He's showing us that he can create illusions. Look at the light and the shadow. Look at the chiaroscuro that is happening on the turban, on the face. Um, he has a sense of age and the redness around the eyes and just the real attention to naturalism and detail are quite apparent here up to the fur lining the neck of the cloak that he's wearing. Super, super realistic, super attention to detail. Um, and he's saying here, so on the frame, 
And if you look in the book, you'll see that the it looks as if it's carved, all these things that he's written. Um, but they actually aren't carved. They're painted. And he's tried to give that shadow, that effect um, of being carved by giving it the same light source as what's happening in the painting. And this effect, trying to trick us into thinking that what is painted on the frame is actually carved, that's what we know as trompe l'oeil, which is trick of the eye. And so that's another um, vocab word that you'll see um, on the vocab list before the exam. Okay, and then finally we're going to end with the Ghent altarpiece, which is a very important um, piece of artwork. And I'm going to um, turn you to a Khan Academy, Khan Academy video for the front and the back. There's actually two separate videos, but I would like it if you would watch them all the way through. They have really nice close-ups of all of the parts of this. And um, I really encourage you to do that. So thanks for listening, you guys. I'll see you on Tuesday. Please email me with any questions. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening.